Artemis 1 finally took off for the moon on the 16th of November 2022, but this new rocket, which is the most powerful yet to make it into space, is not as new as you would think. The four main engines that power the core stage with the help of the two massive solid rocket boosters are the same engines that powered a variety of space shuttles over the last 24 years, and the large orange tank is a modified shuttle main fuel tank, making it the essence of reusability. Yet, for all the advancements that other space programs like SpaceX and Blue Origin have made over the last decade in making expensive hardware reusable, these engines and the main fuel tanks will be on their final journey, and like the F1 predecessors on the Apollo Saturn, they will end up at the bottom of the ocean, which does seem to be a bit of a retrograde step for the latest rocket from NASA. So in this video, we'll look at how the first reusable large liquid rocket engine, the RS-25, came about, and how it ended up as a disposable item. A big thanks go out to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. We've all heard of the expression, it ain't rocket science. Well, obviously when it comes to making groundbreaking new rockets, like the RS-25, then it certainly is. And these things take years and billions of dollars to create and shake all the bugs out of. But where do you start if you're an aspiring rocket scientist, engineer, or just interested in delving deeper in how maths and science make our modern world possible. Well, Brilliant is an interactive problem-solving website and app where you learn by doing, breaking down problems into easily understandable bite-sized pieces before putting it back together to show the result. Their courses are guided by award-winning teachers, researchers, and professionals from MIT, Caltech, Duke, Microsoft, and more. Brilliant has a new course called Introduction to Algebra, something that you'll need to know about if you want to see just what it takes to be a rocket engineer or scientist. This teaches you algebraic expressions, equations, graphs, rates, and more, all in an easily understandable format so you can tackle maths problems that you want to know, but you don't know how to go about doing it. And that's not all. You can learn math, science, and computer science from basic to advanced, all at your own pace and time. Get started now for free, and the first 200 people will get 20% off of an annual premium subscription if you use the link shown here and in the description below. The Aerojet Rocketdyne RS-25, also known as the Space Shuttle Main Engine, or SSME, can trace its history back to the 1960s. Firstly, with the development of the Rocketdyne J-2 engine, which powered the second and third stages of the Saturn rocket, and secondly, to Project Isinglass. The 1967 Project Isinglass was for two classified crewed reconnaissance aircraft, which were studied by the CIA as a possible replacement for the Lockheed A-12 and the SR-71 that would fly up to Mach 5. However, with an eye on what happened to Francis Gary Powers' U-2 when it was shot down over the Soviet Union in 1960, it was considered an insufficient advancement over existing aircraft and still susceptible to Soviet air defences so a second, much more advanced Project Rhinebury was created. This would be a rocket-powered glide aircraft launched over the Atlantic from a B-52 at high altitude, which would then climb to 200,000 feet, flying at Mach 20 over the Soviet Union, so high that it would be well out of range of air defences, before gliding back to Earth and landing at Groom Lake, Nevada. This required a rocket engine powered by liquid hydrogen and oxygen. Rocketdyne was asked to investigate aerospike engines and Pratt & Whitney the more conventional bell-shaped Dillavelle nozzle type engines. At the end of a study, Pratt & Whitney put forward the XLR129. This had 250,000 pounds of thrust and had two unique features. Firstly, it was designed to be reusable and the second, it had a Dillavelle two-position expanding nozzle, which was more efficient over a wide range of altitudes than a single nozzle rocket. It was also throttleable with stage combustion and ran at high pressure, the same attributes that will be required for the later space shuttle engines. However, the cost of Project Isinglass and Rhinebury was beyond the budget of the CIA. 
being the equivalent of 22 billion in today's money. The other issue was that because of its speed, altitude and flight path, it was realised that it would look like an incoming ICBM to the Soviets and could potentially start a war that it was there to prevent. So the project was dropped. Although the XLR-129 carried on, it was never built completely, but it did receive component level tests which made up the basis of Pratt & Whitney's failed Space Shuttle main engine bid. In 1969, when the contracts were awarded for the Space Shuttle development and the initial Phase A studies, Pratt & Whitney, Rocketdyne and Aerojet General worked on an upgraded version of the XLR-129 with a minimum thrust of £415,000 of thrust. This design can be found on many of the shuttle designs up until the final decision in 1970. However, NASA wanted to force the advancement of rocket engine technology in every way. To do this, they specified it should have a traditional bell-shaped nozzle to rule out aerospike designs and have a high-pressure combustion chamber running at at least 3,000 psi. It would also have to be throttleable stage combustion with a delavel type nozzle. This would be the 1970 Phase B competition between the three contractors. Pratt & Whitney was already ahead of the game with their XLR-129, and Aerojet had experience in designing and component testing the 1.5 million pound thrust M1 engine, which would have been bigger than the F1. So Rocketdyne had to spend a lot of money catching up on their development of the J2 engine into the H3, which would become the basis of the SSME. To achieve the 3,000 pound plus PSI combustion chamber pressures, Rocketdyne developed the copper zirconium alloy called Nalloy Z, and in 1971 were awarded the contract to build the shuttle engines, but were immediately held up by a legal challenge from Pratt & Whitney, who believed they had a superior engine. After Pratt & Whitney lost the legal challenge, their engineers were told to destroy the test data so as not to embarrass NASA at some future point if things had gone badly for the Rocketdyne design, which would become the RS-25. All of this was working on the basis that the original shuttle plan would be a two-part system with an orbiter that would be piggybacked onto a crewed flyback booster. Between them, this would require the same engine but with different nozzles for the orbiter and the booster. 12 engines of 550,000 pound thrust would be used on the booster and three engines of 632,000 pound thrust for the orbiter. By the time the engine contract was awarded, budget pressures had forced the design of a shuttle to use the single orbiter and the external fuel tank and solid rocket boosters as we know today. Now there would be just three main engines on the orbiter and the solid rocket boosters would do most of the heavy lifting and a detachable fuel tank would hold the fuel for the SSMEs until it reached orbit. The SSME could be now optimised for just the orbiter and the thrust level was lowered to 470,000 pounds of thrust. One of the features of the stage combustion for the new engine was that the exhaust from the high pressure turbo pumps was fed back into the main engine burner instead of being dumped overboard as a low pressure turbo exhaust as in previous large liquid engine designs like the F1 engines. This would make them more efficient by using all of the available propellants, but at a significant cost in system pressures. It was the high combustion chamber pressure combined with the amplification effect of the stage combustion cycle that made this engine a quantum leap in rocket engine technology, but also created a significant challenge to Rocketdyne and the government team charged with its design and development. The original shuttle and flyback booster design life called for 100 missions and 27,000 seconds, including six exposures to an emergency power level of 109%. With the redesign of the shuttle, 27,000 seconds was equivalent to 55 missions. After a fatigue analysis concluded that if the total number of missions were reduced to 55, then no limit need be placed on the number of exposures at 109% of power. And so the stage was set to build the RS-25, with tests being carried out throughout the 1970s. There were a lot of areas that were beyond any previous engine design and needed an extensive testing before it could be flown on a space shuttle. Over time, there have been a number of upgrades to increase reliability, reduce maintenance and increase power. The RS-25 was broken up into several versions over the years, 
with the original RS-25, then the RS-25A, B, C, and finally D, which could run up to 111% of full power. The RS-25D was the first of the Block II engines and to be used for the Artemis I launch in November 2022 and will be the ones that will be used for future launches until they run out. A total of 46 reusable RS-25 engines, each costing around $40 million, were flown on the Space Shuttle program, with Pratt & Whitney Rocketdyne reporting a 99.95% reliability rate, with only one in-flight failure on STS-51F in 1985, caused by multiple sensor failures leading to the shutdown of the engine and an abort-to-orbit emergency procedure, though the mission did continue. As the announcement of the shuttle's retirement came in 2004, it was thought that the remaining engines might be given or sold off to institutions and universities around the world or kept by NASA. They were proposed to be used on the Constellation program's Ares 5 launch vehicles, but dropped in favour of the RS-68 and the J-2X engines until the termination of the Constellation program in 2010. When the Space Shuttle was retired in 2011 and the SLS was announced, NASA stated that the RS-25 would be used for the rocket's core stage, using between three and five of them depending upon the mission. The US Congress made it part of the SLS funding request that as much of the shuttle technology as possible be used on the SLS, which included the RS-25s, the main propulsion systems, the shuttle main tank, modified and used as the main storage for the SLS, and the orbital maneuvering system engine be used to power the Orion capsule. In all, 118 different astronauts previously flew on the now four Artemis I engines from 1998 to 2001, with engine number 2045 completing 12 missions, 20586 missions, 2056 4 missions, and 2063 missions, all well below the 55 missions which were factored in for the working life of the engines. So when all the usable RS-25Ds have been used up, what will happen then? Well, they'll make more RS-25s. In 2020, NASA awarded a contract to build another 18 for 1.79 billion, but this time they'll be RS-25Es, based on a 2005 study into a single-use variant, and then an even more simplified and cheaper to make version which is currently under development by Aerojet Rocketdyne called the RS-25F. So with the SLS program, we will have come full circle from the disposable Saturns and F1 engines of Apollo in the 1960s through the reusable shuttles and the RS-25s in the 80s, 90s and 2000s and back to the disposable SLS and disposable versions of the RS-25 in the 2030s, all whilst others are pushing for maximum reusability. Make of that what you will, but let me know what you think in the comments. So I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you did, then please thumbs up, share, and subscribe. And thanks go to all of our patrons for their ongoing support.